Um, thank you very much for introducing me. Um, I still feel Amir's energy up here. It was very impressive, um, her presentation and uh, her work. Uh, it's my first time in Ireland, in Dublin, so I'm very happy to be here today, and um, I want to thank the N, uh, S, sorry, NCSE, <laughs> I have to concentrate, um, for the invitation. Uh, the Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education is very happy that we can be here today. And um, what I will do is I want to first explain to you a bit uh, what the work is we are doing, how we do it. I will talk a bit about the principles. I can actually go forward here. Um, we have some key principles uh, that are guiding our work. Um, we also have different activities, as you might know. Um, so one of the current, currently ongoing activity is, um, is, is about learning from the COVID-19 pandemic. That's also why I'm here, I guess. Um, and I will tell you something about this ongoing activity. And it's not surprising, maybe, that our results are a lot uh, interrelated to the former presentation. We have really lots of similar results. And um, I have to mention that also Ireland is part of uh, this activity, and I will tell you more about the constellation and everything in a minute. But I would like to start um, to tell you about the agency um, and what we do. So. Um, What's it about, actually? So we are an independent organization that acts as a platform for collaboration for the ministries of education in member countries. So we are there to support countries um, towards the development uh, um, or in their development towards a more inclusive education system. So um, we don't tell them what to do. We ask them what they need. We try to um, prepare projects together with them. Um, they define the goals, the aims, we try to, um, to answer to those and we suggest projects or activities and um, we then find um, countries who like to participate and we carry out those uh, suggested activities. Um, so, well, that's what I just said. <laughs> uh, the mission is to help member countries to improve the inclusive education policy and practice for all learners. Um, so, we also have a position that is agreed uh, and was agreed on. Um, this position was agreed on already in 2015 and has been reconfirmed now in 2022. And it's a shared vision uh, for inclusive education system uh, that is about all learners of any age and that they are provided with meaningful, high quality educational opportunities in the local community alongside their friends and peers. And this position is um, quite important for, um, well, it's a quite important basis for our work. And we have a short video, it's like two minutes and 30 seconds, I think, about. So I would like to show you this short video for introducing the position. Access to an inclusive education changes lives. By providing an educational experience that is both equal and effective, we create opportunities to take part in society and ultimately grow as people. Not providing the chance to learn alongside others in their local communities, particularly in the early years of school life, can have a profound and lifelong effect. At the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education, we work with over 30 member countries throughout Europe to provide meaningful and high quality educational opportunities that make sure every learner feels included in their local school alongside their friends and peers. From early childhood education through to teacher education and financing, we provide information and guidance in all areas of inclusive education. By identifying needs and raising the achievements of all learners, we can recognize and build on their knowledge and talents to effectively meet their individual learning requirements. To make our shared vision a reality, each country must commit to including every learner, no matter what their needs. An inclusive education system is the shared responsibility of all educators, leaders and decision makers, and so legislation and policy must clearly reflect this vision. The impact of an inclusive educational experience has far-reaching and positive benefits for everyone. So the earlier this begins, the better. Working together throughout Europe, 
we know we can achieve high quality, equitable educational opportunities for everyone. Okay, so I think this very well summarized our vision and included also some of the aims and goals we have um, in the agency, um, but all together with the member countries. And you saw just uh, the map of Europe with the countries, and I would like um, to just show you the picture of um, the 31 member countries we have. Not the picture, there. it's mentioning the names. I won't list them now, but you can see it's quite a lot. You see Ireland is among them. Um, yes, so we are really happy that so many European countries are joining us here and make use um, of our offer in supporting them. Um, I would like to now move to the key principles. Um, and this is actually another basis for our work. So it's listing um, five requirements and uh, also later um, you will see um, operational elements and I want to shortly introduce you to them even though it's like listing them so but I hope it, it supports your understanding of, of what uh, the basis of our work is. Um, <clears throat> so the overarching principle is a widely agreed concept of rights-based inclusive education and we have, re we have already heard today in the welcome um, message this morning from Joe Hayes um, he talked about the right to education and also um, the minister, Josefa Medigan, she, um, no, sorry, <laughs> Professor A. Ring also talked about, uh, about the rights um, and human rights and the right, of, uh, the right to education. So um, one of the five requirements that we have in our key principles are funding and uh, resource allocation and that should support the ongoing development of school communities to increase their capacities to respond to diversity. Uh, the second requirement is um, about an effective governance plan that sets out clear roles and responsibilities. Then we have uh, quality assurance and accountability that supports high quality provision for all learners uh, with a focus on equitable opportunities. The fourth uh, requirement uh, in our key principle is teacher professional training. That means uh, that the continuum of teacher professional learning uh, that develops areas of competences in all teachers uh, regarding the assessment and needs identification and as well as curriculum planning, etc. Uh, and last but not least, uh, curriculum and assessment um, that refers to a single curriculum framework that is sufficiently flexible to provide relevant opportunities for all learners. Um, and we also, these key principles, um, also have eight operational elements. Uh, the first of these uh, operational elements are um, to enable collaboration and effective communication. And if you think about the presentation we just heard before, uh, it was mentioned a lot that we need to uh, enforce um, communication and enable communication between learners and teachers, parents and schools, ministries and schools or school leaders. So um, it is really about communication between ministry, regional and local level decision makers, but also non-governmental um, organizations and schools. Another operational element is to increase the participation in inclusive early childhood education. Um, then we have support um, that we want to support all learners at times of transition. So this is what I meant before that the minister, uh, Josefa Medigan, she mentioned the challenges of employment for persons with disabilities. So we really need to support um, learners in vocational education programs, but also regarding independent living and employment. Um, the fourth operational element we have is to facilitate cooperation between schools, parents and the community to support inclusive school development. We then have um, the need to develop a system for data collection to provide feedback. That means that uh, data can actually um, inform uh, the going uh, improvement uh, ongoing, sorry, ongoing improvement across the whole system and to support decision makers at all levels to identify signals 
that indicate the need for urgent action regarding schools uh, needing additional support. Um, we also need to develop specialist provision to support all learners and increase the capacity of mainstream schools. The seventh operational element then is to develop and support school leaders or school leader teams um, to create an inclusive and equitable school ethos with strong relationships, um, uh, proactive and preventative approaches, flexible organization to intervene when learners are at risk. And last but not least, uh, we need to focus on developing learning and teaching environments and to focus on the learner's voice. We have heard uh, this already today as well, that um, John Kearney actually, um, sorry, it's just John Kearney. <laughs> uh, it's important to listen to learner's voices especially uh, and to see that their rights are fulfilled. So this is just an overview um, of the agency's work and the basis on which we work on and we work together with countries and all our member countries have agreed to these principles. So now relating all of this to the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, we know that now many countries see and recognize that there is a more urgent need to address equity issues. Um, there's the need to improve access to digital learning. Um, they also see that achievement gaps have increased and will require a greater focus on early intervention and prevention in the long term, as well as short term actions. Um, we also see that the countries recognize the importance of learner and teacher well being as an important precondition for all learning. Oops, sorry. Yeah, and that learning is unlikely to take place unless social and emotional needs are met in a safe school climate. And we have heard about the results of the previous um, study that was presented, um, that the importance of well-being um, or the awareness of the importance of well-being has risen and has raised during um, the pandemic especially. So having hopefully given you the basis um, of, the, of our work in the agency, which is really mainly supporting countries and working together with them, I would like you now um, to go with me into a project um, which I'm currently managing together with a team uh, of colleagues. Um, and this is called uh, Learning from the COVID-19 Pandemic, Building Resilience Through Inclusive Education Systems, in short, BRIS. Um, so in this project, we actually um, ask the question, how are inclusive education systems in Europe affected by the pandemic. Uh, we want to look at the lessons learned. Uh, we want to see how to turn the crisis into an opportunity because we all know we have learned a lot and we know what things have worked actually um, or what need to have or get more attention in the future. Um, and this is uh, a way to build a resilience. Uh, and also another question is how to improve coordination in education systems and among countries. And this is one of our goals in the agency. And this is maybe also adding in a European, um, a European perspective here um, that we really uh, encourage countries to talk to each other, to work together, to exchange maybe, pro maybe um, promising practices. Um, at the moment, uh, there is the biannual meeting of the, uh, of the agency taking place in Sofia. And this is usually an event where the countries have the possibility to come together and to exchange, and they, they do so quite intensely, and they, uh, it's also quite fruitful, especially during the coffee breaks as usual. Um, but this is an opportunity also to find um, similar challenges or exchange of promising practices, but also think about things that the agency then um, could address later on. So, um, Yes, the project that we are currently working on, and this is, this is a work in progress, so we are actually in the middle of the project. We started by um, sending out a questionnaire to all our 31 member countries, asking them about the main issues they encountered during the pandemic. So they could actually um, let us know where they would like to put a f uh, the focus that could, they could rank issues, and we collected their feedback. We had also other questions in this questionnaire. But the main issues that were finally identified 
um, through the help of the countries, and you would not be surprised, <laughs> is mental health and social emotional needs. We now call it uh, well-being uh, and learning loss. So these were the topics that the country said they would like us to focus in our activity. Um, we then ask countries usually who would like to participate, we invite them, and uh, we suggested that we make two working groups, two country groups, one working on mental health and social emotional needs, and the other one on learning loss for the start. And uh, we have invited, uh, in the end, and those countries also agreed to work with us, Ireland as a, guy, as a leading country for the group of learning loss, and they work on this topic, or worked on this topic in the last year, um, together with Germany and Bulgaria. And for the topic of mental health and social emotional needs, uh, we were happy that um, Greece uh, accepted to be the leading country together with Estonia and Sweden. So you can see it's a variety of countries <laughs> from all over Europe that came together in that project. So it's six countries we have in the project. Um, and we did, we have planned different activities uh, for them. And actually the project plan that we made, so we suggested to them, we would like to do um, peer learning activities. We would like to do focus group discussions together with different stakeholders. So this project plan has been sent out to all the countries and it was discussed and it was accepted by all the 31 countries. So now this small group of six countries is working on the topic and will come up hopefully next year with a, uh, with a, um, with some material or tools that are then again useful for all of the countries, but obviously will have to be adapted to country context. So you can already see the challenges we are facing in the agency usually, is working with so many countries with such various backgrounds, histories, cultures, um, and trying to really find um, a way to work together to communicate and cooperate. But this is a very fruitful process. So, um, Yes, and also we had done um, uh, literature research of 2020 publications, so everything that was published in 2020 in the European context on the pandemic. And I know that Bram Norwich was here last year, and he actually referred to this uh, literature review, so I won't talk about it anymore, but we have done another thing in between, and we looked at 2021 publications, uh, key publications um, with a different focus that has been recently published on our webpage, all our publications are open access, so you can find this report on the 2021 publications, actually. And um, I want to refer to one of the findings um, of this report. And um, to be better able to deal with future remote learning scenarios, all those involved in the education process need competences. And um, these publications um, offered, for example, that uh, we need to enable learners to work more autonomously and practice self-regulation. So we know that the online learning um, provided uh, was quite complicated for lots of learners. They did not, because very often they had to be more autonomous and work um, on a self-regulated basis, and uh, they were not prepared for that then um, we need to enable teachers to perceive their changed role and design approach, uh, appropriate online learning materials and, online and learning spaces. And then also we need to enable parents and families to best support their children uh, during remote learning. Um, so based on this um, literature reviews and um, uh, the report, we, we worked on preparing the focus group discussions for stakeholders we wanted to invite. And um, we, our plan was to do same level stakeholder discussions. That means we invited learners from the different countries that I just mentioned before. We invited parents um, to talk to each other. So um, learners from Ireland talked to learners from Bulgaria and Germany. And it was very, we did that online, and we had interpretation. It was a very complicated organizational <laughs> um, thing in the beginning, but it really worked out. We were very worried it wouldn't work out, because you know you had to translate forward and backwards. But it worked. And um, we were very astonished how motivated the learners were. They were learners with a special needs background. Uh, they were aged between 15 and 18. 
And um, they were, um, it was very interesting to listen to them. And they were also very interested about the perspectives of learners from other countries and what they um, uh, had as solutions during the pandemic, what they were offered or not. So I remember that a Greek student said, oh my god, in Estonia you did have this great platform. We didn't have something like, things like this. They really talked about what they used, what they did. So. Um, yeah, this was the goal for the same level stakeholder discussions. And the second step then um, was the plan to do multi-level stakeholder discussions. That means all those that have discussed with stakeholders from the different countries went back to their own country, like the Greek parent, learner, teacher, and policymaker, went to Greece and had a meeting there together and discussed on the basis of the prior um, discussions, um, they actually, we asked them to suggest us uh, materials or tools they would like us to develop in our project. So I'm going into detail of these results now. I now am listing um, the priority areas they, they, they brought uh, to us, but we still thought it's interesting, so I will go forward with that. I already mentioned our stakeholders, so we have different levels represented, the individual level, the school level, the community the national and regional levels. Um, before getting into details, I would like to give you some reality bites. You had them already in the previous um, presentation. You also had quotations from the interviews. So from the focus group discussions, a teacher said, the biggest learning loss happened in the area of social-emotional needs. So this already makes it obvious that the two areas are completely interlinked and they overlap. So we address them individually in this first phase, but we will not go on in separating them because the topics that emerged in between or during the process, you will see later on, um, definitely show how much learning loss and social-emotional needs overlap. Another teacher said that before the pandemic, Cooperation was just a word. Now this word has been filled with meaning. So they were very often telling us about the importance to exchange experiences, to talk to colleagues, and to cooperate. Uh, one learner said that he felt trapped at home. It was not nice not being able to see friends. Uh, one of the parents said that anxiety levels rose during the pandemic and children faced very hard situations. And this one mother, excuse me, <coughs> told us that uh, the children got afraid when in public transport people would not wear masks because the kids were told to wear masks to prevent the virus from spreading. So whenever they saw people without masks, they really got anxious. Um, a policymaker said that the big difficulty was among children who come from families that do not value education very much. Educational mediators helped a lot in preventing school dropout. And another learner said that nobody actually cared if we attended classes or not. They were telling us they switched off the camera and started playing community games. They were very open to us. <laughs> um, and uh, you see this is all quite negative experiences here. Oh, well, the cooperation is maybe not a negative experience. But we know that some of the learners actually uh, benefited from online learning situations. This is also something we need to, to um, keep in mind. And that is actually something we can learn from the pandemic. So I would like now um, to go closer to the input, or to go in depth, uh, what the stakeholders suggested. So I will start with the topic of well-being. So the group of well-being was Greece, Estonia, and Sweden. And they were talking about, well, mental health and well-being. They mentioned a lot of curriculum. They talked about, co about cooperation communication and networking, and psychosocial support. And I will now show you um, their actual uh, suggestions. So in the first discussion round that took place in May and June, those were the same level discussions. <coughs> the learners, um, we asked them after the discussion to identify priority areas. So the learners who discussed on well-being suggested to have as a priority area to, to include social emotional training as part of the curriculum, psychological support, and, oops, doesn't work anymore, communication with teachers and parents. 
the teachers who talked about well-being um, with other teachers from other countries suggested as priority areas supervised collaboration on all levels, training on managing teachers' personal and work life. So we now uh, we know lots of teachers. They told us how how burdened they felt during the situation of the pandemic. They could not, you know, they could not stop working anymore. They didn't have their personal life. It was really a, a big issue of, of or danger of burnout. So they really need support there. And they ask for uh, lifelong training for teachers. The parents and families who talked about well-being, they wanted to reinforce cooperation between families and schools. Uh, they wanted to prepare to keep schools open. And you will see this demand also later from another uh, level. Sorry, I don't know why. <laughs> and they wanted to include mental health in the curriculum, like the learners. Um, they said that trustworthiness is important, so they need to be able to trust the school, to trust the system that will take care. Um, networking was important, so they wanted to have experts on mental health and education. I don't know why it doesn't work. Yeah. They also wanted training for teachers. They wanted that they are equipped with tools uh, to reach all learners and prevent burnout. So parents were quite aware uh, of the burden that was, well, on themselves, but also on the, on the teachers. So um, the policymakers who discussed well-being, um, they said that it is important to have funding for inclusive education and revising leg legislative frameworks. Oops. <laughs> they also said it's important to focus on early interventions and to enhance the role of parents. It also was important to them to assess institutions with a focus on inclusive mindsets, so about attitudes. Uh, they wanted to find a good balance between scoring good results and socio-emotional well-being. They also said it's important to include socio-emotional competences in the curriculum, so you, saw, you see this already three times. I think here, oops. They also said it's important to keep, to keep schools open, and I think we all know that this would be one of the most important goals in the case of, of another crisis. So this is uh, priority areas that um, stakeholders were mentioning from the well-being um, group. And uh, going to the group of learning loss, uh, they discussed about communication and training, uh, participation and cooperation, access and equipment. And um, this is just the overall summary always that I start with. So coming to learning loss for learners and when asked them about their priority areas in this area, they mentioned they need more and improved contact. So you already see here it's, it's related to well-being as well. They said it's important to have a routine, and here I always say, um, they always mention the difficulty of rolling out of bed in front of the laptop is quite a bad way to start school. <laughs> so they need a routine. Um, what we just heard before, coming back to school was seen as very problematic for lots of kids. They uh, said it was not easy to adjust again back to the old rhythm and the old routine. It was also important for them to have access and equipment. We know that um, lots of learners didn't have enough equipment. Laptops were lacking. Families had multiple children with only one laptop, etc. And this led to a very a severe consequence um, that not only this actually, but we know that lots of teachers reported that they lost their learners. That means they lost their um, students, they did not have any contact during the pandemic, so they didn't know how to reach them. This was quite a severe problem for some of uh, the schools. Um, they also said teachers need to be better prepared. They said it's important to improve online lessons. They felt boring sometimes, so they were um, not feeling motivated. Oops, sorry, the last one was motivate students. Um, then the teachers who discussed uh, learning loss they said priority areas for them. Um, yeah, one of the quotes I just had before is about the biggest learning loss occurred in the socio-emotional area. So we really know that going to school is not only about learning, but it's about socializing as well. So that uh, there was a big learning loss in this area. Um, for them, it was important to ensure accessibility to devices, to ensure training on IT tools, uh, to have a more continuous assessment and other ways of assessment 
They wanted to get support from outside. They said it's important to teach students how to be responsible for their learning, so making them uh, more autonomous. Um, they also wanted to develop guidelines on online learning and have multi-professional teams. For the parents, when they looked at learning loss, um, and uh, we asked them to pref uh, define the priority areas, they said it's important that there's more collaboration with other parents and also more support for parents. Um, they need to better inform and train teachers about the learners' needs so they didn't feel that the learners' needs were addressed accordingly. Um, and they wanted that uh, appropriate materials is developed for the learners. They also said that it's important that learners need to participate in designing learning environment and processes. And here, um, this is one of the points why we do uh, this stakeholder involvement as well. We also need to think about how to include learners, but also parents and teachers, in decision-making processes on policy level. Um, we also, uh, they also wanted to prepare learners on what will happen. We, also, we know, for example, one teacher, um, they told us, oh, when the pandemic happened, like overnight, um, close, uh, schools were closed, they said, um, it's important that we now meet with the students online. So they met them in a kind of a webinar and they talked to them and they said, okay, this is what happens now. This is how we are going to solve this situation. So they were preparing the students and lots of students told us that this was not the case. They were not able to get prepared actually in such a way. So this is a, was quite a challenge. <coughs> and also parents said uh, it's important to facilitate access to supportive measures. Um, this is the last slide on this um, listing of uh, priority areas. The policymakers who talked about learning loss said it's important to do advisory calls to schools. So that's what uh, they, they intended that to support the schools. They said it's important to have uh, safety and confidence and to develop a feeling of confidence in school, which can also be related to a feeling of belonging, actually, which then we can relate back to what the parents said when they said it's important to be able to trust the school. Uh, they said it's important to motivate learners and encourage teachers to improve teachers' competences, to continue to work with parents, and to have a professional mo monitoring of school development processes to support the schools. And last but not least, listening to school leaders, management, and teachers' needs. So I know this might be a bit <laughs> long list of, of priority areas, but I think it made clear how much the different levels overlapped in their needs and in the suggestions they had, and how much they were aware about the needs of the other stakeholders. So <clears throat> we prepared um, uh, intermediate results on, on all these suggestions, and we provided this to the stakeholders. But before going on, um, we actually could summarize um, the impressions we got from the discussions also with two feelings. I want to shortly um, just mention those. So um, right after the pandemic had started, lots of the stakeholders, parents, teachers, as well as learners, felt overwhelmed and abandoned. So they didn't know where to get the information. They didn't, they were not, well, they were not prepared. They didn't get support. They didn't know who to ask. Uh, it was uh, a real difficult situation, and we all know that. And the other feeling is the feeling of being left out. So we know that learners very often reported back to us, they were not able to ask questions. They didn't have the support they needed. You know, even though the, 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 the lessons were online and they were maybe um, in contact with the teachers, this was not possible. But also parents and teachers felt left out. So just to give you the last overview again, what, we just, what I just presented to you, in the area of well-being, there was um, a focus on training on mental health and well-being, on the curriculum, on uh, cooperation, communication, networking, and on psychosocial support. Um, when looking at learning loss, we have communication and training, participation and cooperation, and access and equipment. So from this, um, we did this intermediary results. We uh, drafted a report for the groups who participated. We gave it to them, and we asked them to prepare for a meeting 
in their country together with policymakers. So you can imagine the students were quite excited. Um, they sometimes met at the ministry for these multi-level stakeholder discussions. So we know <clears throat> in some cases they had teachers who took the intermediary results to prepare the learners for these discussions. We used um, a dialogic structure for these multi-level stakeholder discussions. That means we wanted to address the power relations, the difference of power the levels we have there. So, um, and the countries organized these multi-level um, discussions themselves. We received uh, a report from them and then worked with this report. So we know, we asked them in this meeting on the basis of the same level discussions, please <clears throat> try to think about any um, strategies to address and overcome the challenges you mentioned. Try to give us, best thing would be a concrete tool <laughs> with concrete steps, with concrete content. Um, so they tried their best, but we know it was very hard because the, the, the focus was on discussing this with stakeholders. Um, but we got back from them 15 different suggestions on what they would like us to do in the second year of our project. And we tried to group those suggestions to make sense of them and um, to see uh, if they can work with it. And these, uh, we defined four working groups um, to develop strategies to address and overcome challenges. And these were just suggestions for them. So in short, we have working group A, B, C, D. And I would just very shortly tell you about the content of this. Uh, five minutes? I know. I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, Group A was digital online learning and teaching. And uh, the suggested tool was guidelines for digital literacy training. It was about building capacity in digital literacy across all education stakeholders. And the content hereby would be to ensure equality of access to hardware software, building the ability to maximize use of digital platforms, having a balanced approach, building skills as a continual process that aligns with teacher professional learning, and possibilities of use of regional educational centers to provide training as facility to upskill all, so wider than school. These are all suggestions that came from the countries. We did not change the content, we just summarized it. Um, yes, and also provision of active support to local teams. At the working group B, it was about having a crisis management protocol and training. Um, so that was about creating safe and secure psychosocial environments, creating specific protocols of course of actions, addressing challenging psychosocial emergencies, being able to, pro uh, to act proactively and feeling prepared for psychosocial emergencies. So we see here, it's a lot about the well-being um, uh, issue. Uh, addressing needs of learners early and psychological recovery from stressful situations, as well as provision of active support for the local teams. And we had two very concrete suggestions here, an international review on well-being, measuring instruments, and a self-review tool for schools on their mental health capacities. And then we had working group C, effective communication. So that was about guidelines for joint work in school teams and effective communication. They suggested support groups, handbooks and a compendium of promising practices. Here, I think the promising practices is a really important thing. Um, building on effective communication systems that already exist, establishing a helpful and fruitful feedback culture for teachers in teaching and counseling situations, and um, the suggestion of a social worker uh, with advisory functions. I know that in Ireland you have the liaison, homeschool liaison teacher that actually takes over this position. So this is, um, for example, one, there would be one promising practice maybe also for other countries to look at. And then we have the working group D, the community support. So there, the tool suggested was guidelines for activating community support. It's about communities that provide respite and mitigate burnout for families most in need, to create supportive links in the community around students and families. Um, then they also said uh, they, they focused on the importance of homeschool liaison support. Then it was important that the parents have a say in what support they need and who they need it from, and raising awareness. Okay, this I want to go back. Um, so, this is, actually, oops, this is actually where we're at right now. 
we have this working group, and I just came from Sofia yesterday evening, uh, and then Tuesday we have presented these results to all the countries that have participated, and we wanted them to discuss it. So we made this, you might know the World Cafe approach, where you go from table to table and discuss things, and you just collect things and answers and positions. And that's what they did. And um, the way forward now is, I have one more slide, but I will skip that because I can talk, um, I can speak better about it and showing you the, what is on it. <laughs> they have made some choices <clears throat> uh, during these discussions. And what we will do now is, we will go back to the stakeholders in January. We will have meetings, one meeting in Dublin, one meeting in Athens, and we will discuss with the stakeholders because our big challenge, but our big aim is to keep the, uh, the stakeholders on board throughout the process until the end and to make sure that what we develop is having an effect, an impact throughout all the levels from policymakers to parents, teachers, but also learners on the grassroots level. Fine, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much.